Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and really pleased to have with me once again Gene Epstein. We like to have Gene on us on with us the first Tuesday of every month because he uh, he leads a very interesting discussion at the New York City Junto uh, that's held on the first Thursday of each month at the General Society Library. That's at 20 West 44th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. It starts around 7.30 or uh, 8 o'clock. The main speaker starts to talk, but uh, it is always a very interesting event. I try to make it and plan to make it this Thursday uh, every month uh, because it's always intellectually stimulating. Gene does a fantastic job of leading the discussion, and then it, it's opened up to people uh, to respond to the uh, to the main speaker and his uh, and his items uh, his his views can be challenged and are most often challenged and uh, it's always a very interesting discussion. So, Gene, welcome. I'm really glad to have you back with me again. Good to be back. Uh, and uh, by the way, I'm I'm grateful that uh, over the last uh, several months we began uh, putting uh, the Junto evenings on a podcast. And uh, for listeners, it, uh, J- Junto is spelled J-U-N-T-O. And uh, go into iTunes or the Junto website, you can hear a podcast of my talk on uh, on the uh, Thomas Piketty book. Uh, you can hear a very interesting talk. That actually, I guess the one you missed last month, uh, Jay, from Brian Kaplan on um, economists from George Mason University on uh, on uh, the case against education, a very strong libertarian argument, which uh, engendered a lot of discussion. And so uh, if you miss a junta, you can listen to it on podcast. But if you come, then, of course, you can uh, your voice can be recorded for posterity if you make a comment or ask a question, because as you indicate, Jay, it's very interactive. That's a bit of a difference about our format. We do allow, uh, we spend more more time or audience questions and comments um, in, a, in about a two about an hour and forty five minutes. The speaker has about half of that time, and then the comments and questions from the audience take up the other half and uh, interspersed throughout the speaker's remarks. Uh, this time around, we're having uh, Donald Boudreaux back. Don Boudreaux, who's a George Mason uh, economist as well, and uh, he distinguishes himself because he's sort of a latter-day Henry Hazlitt, uh, the mm-hmm. great uh, economic free market journalist. Much of you know when Henry Hazlitt did uh, economic did a book called Economics in One Lesson. Uh, he um, he was essentially commenting on all of the crazy nostrums of the media and of the mainstream on on the subject of economics. He had, as you may know, the, the uh, that book began actually taking the, the case from Bastian on the broken window idea that, that whenever a window is broken, it's good for the economy. Yeah. It just began with that one. And um, Don Boudreau writes a letter almost every day to the media, usually very funny and laser-sharp uh, comments uh, addressing the various fallacies and uh, of course it's so much dismaying that uh, Don has at times uh, addressed the broken window fallacy but he turned that into a great joke. There's an economist uh, named Peter Marici, I have to name him because um, he's on my list of Noirs along with Krugman and Stiglitz and <laughs> other Nobel laureates, but Marici actually wrote about, I can forget which hurricane was going to be wonderful for the economy and, uh, and Don uh, wrote, I think, the witty repost about how uh, destructive hurricanes are supposedly wonderful. He offered to go over to Marici's house down in Maryland and uh, with, with crowbars and hammers and split it apart, wreck the home, and uh, so that it would be great for Marici's economic uh, <laughs> well-being. And then he said, and as an added bonus, I won't clean up the mess uh, afterwards so that I can create jobs in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, that was the level of Marici's economic analysis. And uh, so what I'm going to do with Don, as I did uh, did two years ago, Don Don's book was called a, coll- a collection uh, published uh, two years ago called Half Wits and Hypocrites. You know, letters from Cafe Hayek, uh, Half Wits and Hypocrites. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be sort of be in the guise of Paul Krugman or Joseph Stiglitz or others who commit economic fallacies, and then Don is going to respond. Oh, uh, with that should be critique. fun. And then the audience will comment. So uh, it's going to be very interactive and. Uh, Again, should be a lot of fun. This will be an evening where economics can be fun, although, of course, somewhat dismaying um, to learn that so many of the fallacies that uh, just will never go away keep persisting in the New York Times and elsewhere. Yeah, of course, your show is promoting uh, truth. Yeah, 
Right. The, the, the dismal science, indeed, yeah. it is, uh, given the uh, the mainstream thought these days. Gene, hey, Jay, you know, I've got to the, correct the you. Just a moment. You know, you know, of course, Jay. Do we have to have time out? The dismal science is actually probably it's okay to say that, but you uh, you may know that uh, that that it was called the dismal science by uh, what's his name? Some Thomas. Uh, why am I forgetting his last name? Uh, but he called the dism, dismal science because he was pro slavery. The British, mm. or the, he was pro slavery, and he thought that the economists like John Stuart Mill, who, who were anti-slavery, were practitioners of the dismal science because they thought that uh, that black people uh, were just as good as white people. That was uh, mm. that was why it was called the dismal science. So it's an oh. honorific. It's an honorific, Jay, to be called the oh. dismal science. Well, I, I look at it as a dismal science, given the fact that uh, mm-hmm. so many people, including those that you just named, uh, yeah. are, are really, uh, really do believe in, uh, uh, you know, in this hurricane thesis or this, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, it, and and so we send, uh, I guess, uh, sort of uh, the war. Um, machinery that we have yeah. also, right, can be great. We we go into countries and destroy them, and then we build them back up, and it's all great for GDP. Yeah, yeah. yeah in uh, theory. Yeah, absolutely. But that's the religion yeah. of our day, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, no, indeed it is. Although, you know, I, I'll tell you, it, it's it's a, it's odd that the that the fallacy persists, even though, by the way, when uh, Bush, uh, when George W. Bush invaded Iraq, uh, the economy in that quarter definitely uh, tanked. There was definitely a lot of pessimism in the mm-hmm. economy, and a lot of businessmen were holding back, consumers were. Of course, there was a fear of a, an attack by terrorists. Uh, and so, uh, palpably, we had evidence that uh, the market, it doesn't especially like war, but yeah. uh, they still persist in these uh, in, in these in these fallacies that uh, our war expenditures are so great for the economy. Well, I suppose they're great for some people's economy, the people that are getting paid to produce the machinery and uh, and, and so on, and the bureaucracy in Washington, which is unbelievably growing uh, at such a rate. But Gene, sure. uh, yeah. a, a, anything else you'd like to add about Mr. Boudreau? Well, no, uh, basically, come. I, I've, I've arranged a series of slides. You'll hear about how, why Paul Krugman endorses, you know, higher minimum wage. Uh, mm-hmm. You'll hear about uh, why, of course, uh, politicians and uh, and even certain uh, and uh, and Donald Trump is all for uh, tariffs. Uh, you'll hear some illustrious names and uh, uh, associated with uh, age-old economic fallacies, and uh, and Don will uh, be uh, addressing those fallacies and addressing those uh, those illustrious names and uh, and how deluded they uh, they persist in being. Well, it's always a good time. I should tell our listeners that somewhere between 70 and 150 people or so, it's a, it's a nice size group, but it's an interactive group. And it's not only uh, a lot of really smart people, Gene. They're people that are very well educated. You know, I think at a time when the attention span of average Americans, especially younger Americans, is so short, uh, this, is a, this is a group of people that get together and really dig deep into uh, certain topics and lots of ideas that are stimulating. I, I tell you, I just like to go there and just listen to the various uh, smart people uh, ideas and some of them maybe you don't agree with but that's okay it's it's always good uh, to to be able to to mix it up a little bit and have ideas exchanged so I think you do a marvelous job of that I just really like to appeal to my listeners mm-hmm. all of those of you who are in the New York City mm-hmm. metropolitan area this is the General Society Library 20 West 44th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue New York City near Grand C- Central Terminal and uh, the show gets underway uh, doors are open around 7 I believe Gene but 7.30 yeah. To eight, the sort of, uh, and then at eight o'clock, the main speaker uh, talks. You usually invite people uh, if they have some announcement that's uh, mm-hmm. apropos yes. to come will. up yes. and talk about it before the main speaker comes up. It's, if, it's, you're, it's a, uh, if you're looking for a job, you can make a two-minute advertisement about your skills, and who knows, maybe somebody will hire you. And uh, indeed, uh, you know, in an age when uh, we are dominated by sound bites, you know, I, I have an affection for William F. Buckley's show "Firing Line." Most of the, mm-hmm. much of the time, I actually disagree with him, but uh, he. He, he had people talk in paragraphs. You, on your uh, podcast, we can talk in paragraphs so when uh, when we need a paragraph uh, rather than in sound bites. And, uh, of course, in an evening of interactive uh, discussion, we can also talk in paragraphs, and that's, uh, that's very important the, uh, for any kind of uh, interesting thought. 
Well, interesting thought, and I think it's very good, and very important for society to hold it together that we start yeah. to think about things and not just mm-hmm. react impulsively, mm-hmm. which seems yeah. to be uh, too much of the way things are going. With a minute or two left here yet, yeah. I would like to just ask you a little bit about mm-hmm. uh, Up and Down Wall Street, written mm-hmm. by your colleague Randall Forsyth, mm-hmm. uh, titled Gold No Longer Slumbers. Well, I can tell yeah. you, Gene, that as, mm-hmm. as one who's really invested probably more heavily than I should be in gold, I still feel like it's slumbering, mm-hmm. uh, and I feel mm-hmm. my gold shares are not doing very very well, and mm-hmm. uh, so when I saw that, mm-hmm. uh, it was encouraging to see a mainstream uh, publication like Barron's, which I consider it to be. Uh, uh, so, uh, could you just mm-hmm. pass along, perhaps, uh, Mr. Forsyth's uh, thesis a little bit yeah. on why he thinks gold may no longer be slumbering? Yeah. Well, of course, I've known. Uh, I've, I've been with Barron's for 22 years, and when I joined Barron's, Randy had been Randy Forsyth had been with Barron's for about 10 years. So, of course, we've uh, we've we've spent a lot of uh, time together, and. Uh, uh, I, uh, Randy wrote uh, a very uh, well-written, very insightful piece in which he pulled together a lot of interesting indicators that gold could be coming out of its slumber. Uh, I, I believe, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to Randy about this, but uh, I believe actually there was only one glaring omission, which is uh, that Randy expected, Randy talked about uh, the, the constructive bullish outlook for gold, but then uh, he said, well, you know, but you know, he doesn't expect Inflation to heat up, but ah. uh, my but but my that that that's a uh, potentially a problem. My only point that uh, Randy, the glaring omission on Randy's part, honestly, is that uh, that uh, the the bull market in gold that started in about oh two oh three, uh-huh. and that uh, and, and essentially, of course, we you know it's still a bull market. We were we were talking about three hundred dollar gold, two hundred fifty dollar gold, what in oh two oh three, right? And um, and so and, and hitting highs of, of close to two thousand. That was not accompanied by officially measured inflation running very high at all. And no. so, now what, now, so my, my, when I lecture on gold, uh, I, uh, I generally point out that really, um, the gold, the, the, the reason why there was a bear market in gold from 85 into the early aughts was because of the great moderation, uh, at least the image of the great moderation that, that, that those who ran the global economy finally had things under control, that the volatility of the market Markets and volatility of the economy, and, and generally, had been tamed. And mm-hmm. then, uh, the, I think the gold, the gold bulls began to see by uh, about two, a couple of years before that, that began to suck that that it was a, that was not happening, and that's why gold rose. My point, obviously, from that is that gold uh, rises not just because uh, uh, officially measured prices are rising. Gold prices rise because the market begins to wake up to the fact that uh, the central bankers uh, and uh, those in charge of the treasuries around the world uh, do not have things under control, mm-hmm. and that it doesn't have to be uh, price inflation, uh, just as it didn't have to be price inflation that pulled up the price of gold from 03 up to essentially the present. Uh, mm-hmm. It's basically economic instability. I'm terrible at timing, but I believe I believe that the 10-year outlook, sooner or later, maybe it'll be sooner rather than later, sooner or later um, the market will wake up to the fact that the global economy is, 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 is still unstable, that there is no great moderation returning. And uh, so the 10-year outlook for gold uh, is, is, uh, is essentially uh, bullish from that perspective, not from the perspective of price inflation, but from the perspective of global instability. And mm-hmm. that's what I think, that's what I think uh, Randy in an otherwise very uh, good piece uh, neglected uh, to, uh, to mention. Yeah, in fact, Randy was mentioning, he sort of drew some parallels parallels to the 1930s and, yeah. and talking mm-hmm. about the beggar thy neighbor banks, uh, central right. banks, as you're talking about issuing huge amounts, almost endless amounts of new money uh, creation. Uh, it isn't really triggering out into any kind of, uh, certainly not any kind of hyperinflation, although John Williams coming on in just a couple of minutes will probably uh, will probably t- tell us that, hi- that inflation is higher than, mm-hmm. uh, than what the government is acknowledging, but even John would admit that we're not anywhere near any kind of inflation rates, I think, that we were uh, uh, near well, the 1970s. But, 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 but by the way, Jay, as you know, I, I was getting semantic on you about dismal signs. You know that uh, that you know the 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 instability. You know the, the the Austrians. In fact, all the dictionaries 100 years ago <laughs> used to define inflation as a huge expansion in the money supply. It, yes. it, whether or not it affected officially measured prices, and yes. uh, and so obviously, and as you know, there was a f- officially 
measured inflation in the 20s sometimes fell, but that didn't that uh, didn't belie the fact that that there was that there was inflation and mm-hmm. that that inflation led uh, to the crash of 29 and and uh, and to the ensuing uh, depression. So again, uh, it's almost a semantic issue. I think that the 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 the, the, the money uh, authorities are inflating, whether it's affecting consumer prices or not is is not I think a central point. I think it's really mm-hmm. that they are inflating the money supply and that could be affecting assets and affecting other things as well. It it most importantly uh, creates instability in the economy. It affects instability according to the Austrian business cycle theory uh, with respect to to the way uh, investment is allocated and the way risks are taken. So that's a crucial point to my mind. No question about it, Gene, and the the malinvestment concept that occurs Mm -hmm. when interest rates are pushed down way below whatever they should be if uh, Mm -hmm. if it was a free market. And there's Mm -hmm. no question we're going to be paying, I think, one heck of a price in the future. I think we're already paying a price in terms of unemployment and so forth. But that's uh, uh, that's many different topics here. Uh, Just Mm -hmm. uh, in summing up, Gene, I'd like to ask you, uh, I hope you don't mind me asking you. If no. you were to give the United States economy a grade now from A to F, oh God, uh, <laughs> what, what, what would you give it? Well, uh, right now, you know, I think it's going to muddle through. I think it's, you know, a grade. You know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll, I'll say that I, I do believe, uh, by the way, that you know, the, the, that the black gold oil, the crude oil, has gotten, as you know, a lot cheaper. That's a, that's of course uh, a tribute to entrepreneurs. Uh, that's a huge boost to the uh, U.S. economy and to oil-consuming nations. Uh, and so I, I believe that. Uh, while well, I believe that if you want to use official uh, GDP measures that there will be three and a half percent growth over the next year and a half is that probably the um, the instability of the uh, the inherent instability is not going to affect the economy so uh, I guess I'm giving it a B uh, certainly uh, there should be you know, in a free market you should have six percent growth uh, in any kind of uh, market that isn't hobbled by Obama Obamanomics we should be having four to five to six uh, four to five percent growth but three and a half percent I think is probably what we will have over the next uh, between now and the end of next year. Okay, well, a B. Uh, that's that's pretty good in my books. I mean, a no, B no, is a, I, I, yeah. I mean, not a D is in dog, but a B is in boy. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I certainly, uh, many times in my college mm-hmm. career, was happy with a B. I'll say that. So, uh, you know, a, not one of those guys that got all A's. So a B's are pretty good. Uh, I, yeah. I personally probably mm-hmm. would would call it a C minus or something, but then I'm more of a pessimist than you are, Gene. I'm yeah. always glad to have you on because you do provide some sunshine and some hope. So uh, it's always good to <laughs> always <laughs> always good to talk to you, and I really look forward to to meeting up with you uh, this Thursday at the New York City June Show. Thank sure. you very much, Gene, for being with us once again. My pleasure. Bye bye. 